we get bogged down in the nitty gritty, um, in the details of all the to-do lists. And so hopefully by bringing some structure into that, you can make some time for yourself to be able to really tell your library story because everybody has a great story happening at their library every day. Um, and then I also want to mention that this is an abbreviated version of a presentation I did at the 2019 ILA conference with Emily Glimco from Addison Library. So today I'm kind of talking more about the marketing process when you have a team in place. And then as Dan mentioned, Emily uh, in May will be talking about doing marketing when you are a one-person team at your library. Um, so hopefully today, even if you are a team of one or even if you don't have dedicated marketing staff at your library, there still will be something that you can take away and, and give a try. Okay, so today I'm here to tell you that structure is good in libraries and in library marketing. Okay, so it's good, but why is it important? Because chaos is ineffective, plain and simple. So even though it might take time to establish structure in your library's marketing, trust me, it's worth it. For your own sanity and for the benefit of your library patrons too, it's worth the time and effort you'll put in up front. Because once you establish some structure and processes for everybody to follow, you'll again, you'll free up time in your schedule. So then you can expand and you can experiment and you can really enjoy your marketing work. So today I plan to tell you about the structure that I put in place here at Schomburg's marketing process, um, including how I got our director and other staff members on board with this big change. And then I'll share some tips for you to consider as you look to better manage the marketing process at your library. So let's dive in and we'll take a look at the changes I made here at Schomburg to bring structure to our marketing process. Um, but to start, I'll give you a little bit of basic information about our library just so you have some context about the place where I work um, and, and where we made all this happen. So at Schomburg Library, we serve about 130,000 residents in Schomburg Township. We are open 82 hours each week and we see about a million visitors every year through our three locations. In our 2018-19 year, we had more than 2.7 million items checked out, and we offered more than 3,400 programs with just under 93,000 people in attendance. Now, when I started at Schomburg Library in November of 2015, the marketing staff consisted of three full-time and one part-time staff members. The library had never had a marketing director before, so it was a newly created role that I was filling. And I pretty quickly learned that the current marketing staff had little to no say in the projects they did. Just about any staff member could fill out a request for just about any item, and my team would just fulfill the request, no questions asked. And this was not what I was used to. I, uh, before working at this library, I worked in the nonprofit world um, as a marketing director at a few different organizations for about seven years, and this was not the process I was used to, so I was kind of blown away. So in May 2016, about six months into my job, I approached our executive director with a plan to change the marketing process within our library. Um, but before I explained my process to our director, I explained why. I talked about why this change would be good and why it was in the best interest of our library. And here's what I said. The idea is to have a strategic, comprehensive plan that prioritizes our promotions. By centralizing these decisions, rather than having each staff member decide how their program or service be promoted, we can more easily achieve organizational focus and be sure we're not inundating patrons with unnecessary promotions. Of course, our director already knew this, right? She hired me to do exactly this, to centralize the marketing decisions in one department under one person. But I think my reiterating it for her made her feel more confident in my ability to make it happen. And so then this is the process that I uh, proposed to her. There were these three main components. Um, and parts one and two, graphics requests and marketing requests, those really go together. So our library already had a digital work order system in place, and I just wanted to change up how we used it. So what we previously called a graphics request would now be called a marketing request. So the emphasis, again, is uh, just a little bit different. It's not other people telling the marketing staff, well, I just need you to put a graphic on this thing. So again, uh, we'll get into that about some of the questions that they answer in this form that sort of tweaks why it's marketing instead of graphics. Um, and we'd make that form work a little harder for us too. So again, we're gonna change the type of questions that staff have to answer, um, and then that system can automatically assign specific tasks to our graphics coordinator. Okay, so I'm gonna jump away from my presentation for a second to show you the form so I can really get into this and break it down for you. Okay. It's not the prettiest form, but this is our digital form, um, and it's through a product called SolarWinds. 
And uh, you can see here, we use it for lots of other departments too. And that's why it was important to me to stick with this product. Um, so even though it's not the prettiest, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, it maybe doesn't do everything I quite want it to do, our staff were used to it and we're using it in other departments. So we're not having to take on an additional expense. So staff members choose if they want a marketing request. And then they have these options to select from. And if they choose that they want more copies of an item, revisions made to an item, or to promote a staff-only event, then the form populates with these questions. So things like, what changes do you need? How many copies do you want? Should we staple this? Things like that. And these requests are assigned directly to our graphics coordinator. Generally speaking, these are items that we've made before, so something that I've already seen and approved. And so it's okay for our graphics coordinator to just make more copies or make small revisions. And sh she also knows that if something looks out of line to her, she'll bring it to me. She's really good about that, of even a little tiny thing. She'll say, this is not what I was expecting. Are you okay with this? Um, so we've got really good communication there just to make sure we're, we're staying within our standards for um, all of our marketing pieces. And I also do get an alert about these. I get an email whenever these are submitted. So I can just keep an eye on things. Um, and again, keep that open communication with our graphics coordinator. Okay, we're gonna reset the form here for a second. Okay, so now if they say they want a marketing request, but they want additional promotion for a program, help with an item that will be used at a program to promote a service or resource not in the guide, or to suggest a brand new marketing piece or initiative, then the form populates with these questions. So who's the intended audience? Do you have a specific idea in, or medium in mind? So we're asking different sorts of questions. We're asking them to think about this differently. Again, it's not them coming and saying, I, I just need a poster to promote this collection. N nope, you don't get to decide that right now. Tell me what you want to promote and then I'll find the best way to do it. Um, so it's, it's these requests that come in um, are assigned to me. So again, I can review them, I can see what they're looking to do and what they're looking to achieve, and then I can assign these um, tasks right to one of my team members through this online form system. And I can also talk to the staff member making the request um, and get more information, or if it's something that we're not gonna do, I can just tell them, no, I'm really sorry, we're not gonna be doing that. And when and that's the case, I make sure to talk to them and really explain why I'm saying no, so that moving forward, we're on the same page too as, as coworkers and, and know what we're trying to accomplish together. So even though our staff were used to using this form, we were asking them to use it in a different way and to answer different questions. So as I presented this plan to our director, I'm jumping back over here. She very wisely suggested that I create a decision tree. Um, and this is what we came up with, uh, because as she pointed out, most staff who use the request system only used it for one or two things. With the decision tree, they could easily understand how the changes to our marketing process would directly impact how they use this request form and the items they typically were looking for. So with this decision tree, if your path ends at green, you're good to go. Marketing will handle your request for you. If your path ends at orange, marketing will talk to you more about it and decide the best way forward. So now I'm gonna jump back to part three of my revised proposed process, and that's this part right here, program promotion. So this decision tree for our new process is basically telling staff, if you want to promote your program with a flyer, a poster, a press release, or you wanna put it on Facebook or in the email newsletter, don't submit a request for that. Marketing is planning all of that for you now. So moving forward, I would determine if programs needed additional promotion beyond a listing in our guide or on our website. And if so, then again, I would be the one deciding the appropriate marketing channels and timing. So we wouldn't rely on staff requests to make those decisions. So you might be thinking, okay, that sounds great, but how do you make those decisions? Well, I'm really fortunate that right around the time I was proposing this new marketing process, we were also creating these library-wide programming goals. And I let these goals and our mission set my priorities for how to promote our programs. So uh, we send out, we call it our guide. Some people might call it your newsletter or your brochure, um, but we send that out uh, every other month. And so to coincide with that, I create a giant matrix listing every single program and how we're going to promote it. And I create that matrix and base those promotional decisions on these goals and our mission. 
And then I send that matrix to the appropriate department head and they review it and they have a week to suggest any changes. And honestly, I rarely get any suggestions at all, but I pretty much accommodate anything they request at this stage. If they took the time to review my ideas and they want to collaborate, I really try to find a way to say yes. So then once that matrix is finalized, one of my staff members goes back to that online form and inputs everything into our marketing request system. And so that way my team can more easily manage their workflow and we can track our statistics of um, how many item, items we're creating. So staff can still use the marketing request to ask for additional promotion for a program. But again, honestly, few people do. They've kind of gotten used to this system and trust that we know what we're doing because it's been working. So if people do take the time to make those requests, again, I accommodate a lot of those. Um, my, my promotional plan is pretty conservative, so we do have room to add in an extra poster or a targeted email here and there. But if we've already done a good amount of promotion for a certain program, or if there's something more important that we have to focus on that's happening in the library, I do tell people no. And again, I talk to them and explain why I'm telling them no. So our director gave the green light to all of this, and so I put the wheels in motion, got my team all prepared for this change, and got them on board, and then I worked with IT to update that uh, online request form, and then it was time to sell it again. And at my library, selling this change to the staff was much harder than selling it to the director. Um, the director, again, kind of hired me to do this and knew what she was looking for, um, but the staff weren't really prepared for this big change that was coming. So I crafted an email and I sent that to everyone who has access to the marketing request system. So our management team, all the librarians, and some other key staff members too. And then I followed that email up with in-person visits to the appropriate departments. And at those meetings, I explained the new process, I shared that decision tree, and I gave the timeline for the change. So it's not like this is happening right now with no preparation. You know, we had about a month or so so they could get used to the idea so they could ask questions so we could all make sure we understood what was coming. And also in those meetings, I made sure to tailor my message to each group of staff so that they really felt like I had thought specifically of them um, and I was trying to anticipate their questions and, and know what they would need when I was making this change to our marketing structure. And the main points of my message that were in my email and that I mentioned multiple times in those face-to-face -face meetings were that this process will create more consistency in our promotion, refocus responsibilities so all staff members can concentrate on doing what they do best, incorporate a strategic comprehensive plan that prioritizes program promotion based on programming goals, and allow staff members to share ideas and collaborate with the marketing team. Change is hard, of course, but overall, this change was well received. And I left the door open to feedback, and I heard from a few people, but just about everybody was on board with the changes. I had the support of the, of the executive director and the department director, so it was pretty clear to everybody that this was the way forward. Sorry, need a little sip of water there. Um, and because the marketing process and decision tree were now centralized and streamlined, it freed up time for me and my staff to do some really fun and amazing projects. So uh, like we created this great activity book for our 2018 Summer Challenge. We made some really fun promotional videos for an exhibit that we hosted, uh, and we revamped our materials for our 1001 Books Before Kindergarten program. Okay, so. You've heard what works at Schomburg, but let's talk about how you can use these experiences to create a marketing structure that works for you and your library. So here are a few thoughts to consider as you review your marketing process and what you might like to change. Think about what's a good fit for your library. Take a look at your library's priorities in a holistic way. All libraries offer a lot more than programs, but we seem to spend a disproportionate of t amount of time marketing our programs. So be sure that your marketing process allows you to spend time bringing awareness to all that your library has to offer. Think about your skills and work style and build a framework that supports those. How much lead time do you need for various types of requests? What will you do if somebody submits a request late and you have to try to scramble to make, make the item that they need? Take a hard look at what currently takes up most of your time and think about what your ideal work schedule would be filled with. How are those different? How can bringing structure to your marketing process help you move closer to your ideal? What kind of timelines or processes are staff already used to? What can be adapted so it works harder or smarter for everyone involved? 
think about how I changed the way we use the digital request system that staff were already familiar with. So it's obviously important to create a structure that works for you, but you also have to be sure that others can work within the structure. The easier you make it for staff to follow your new processes, the more likely they are to participate willingly. Finally, have confidence in your plan. It's key to get your director on board, so be sure your message focuses on the fact that this is what you need to do your job and do it well. Also think about other key players at your library and how you can get their buy-in. So make the change sound really easy for them. You can say, you know, it's just one extra step for you and it's only a couple times a year. It's no big deal. And then continue to communicate your plan with confidence. Remind staff about why this change is important and how it will make everyone's lives easier. And I hope that this information will empower you to kind of pause and ask these questions of yourself and of your marketing process and then you'll feel uh, like it's, it's really okay to make the changes that you want to see in your library's marketing structure. And that's it from me. So we will turn it back over to you for questions. Hopefully I can stop sharing my screen and bounce it back over to Dan. Yeah, I think we got it here, okay. Okay. All right, so you can see my screen, oh, going the wrong way. Let me find where, <laughs> where I am here. Okay, we're close. There we go. Okay, so yes, this is the point where uh, we are going to open it up for questions. Uh, so um, Hollis is going to stay on the line, and you know, if you have any questions for her, you can put them straight into the chat box. I've already put in um, a prompt for uh, inviting you to do so. Um, if you uh, if you want, this is probably a good time to expand your chat box. Uh, this will give you a chance to uh, to see the larger conversation and a much uh, a bigger uh, portion of your screen. Um, as soon as we're done with the Q and A, as soon as the questions have uh, dried up, and and actually this is great timing. We've got um, more than half an hour to do uh, Q and A, and then also we'll do a discussion. Uh, we've come up with some questions for you all, some discussion uh, some discussion questions that um, you know we want to hear your answers. We want to hear um, exactly what is happening in your own library. Uh, so I will submit those questions and they will look uh, like they'll start with Q1 and that will just, oops, sorry about that. Uh, what did I do? Oh yeah, okay. That They will say Q1 and that's how you uh, can respond uh, and, and just uh, submit your own uh, answer and you can put A1 in order to, oops, okay. Uh, how do I get my, trying to, get my chat box here. There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Quick technical difficulties. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. So Hollis, your first question here is, uh, what is the name of the software solar wind and is the software free? Yeah, so it's it's solar winds plural, um, and it is not free. I don't know a cost off the top of my head, um, just because we use it across so many departments, and so our in our budgeting process it gets wrapped up as sort of just a general IT expense. Um, I don't think it's super expensive, but again, I didn't want to be uh, planning for and budgeting a new a new system when we already have one in place that kind of does most of the stuff we need it to do. Um, and it's also something that other departments can utilize. So we've just tried to make the best of it. Um, I, I, I apologize that I don't have a specific cost off the top of my head, but I can certainly find that out and get back to Dan. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, sorry for the back and forth here. I'm having tr trouble keeping my chat box open. Uh, that would happen right now. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, next question is, Despite your matrix, do staff ever express feeling uh, like their program slash project isn't being promoted as much as it should be? Um, yeah, I will say there's, honestly, it's mainly only a couple of staff members that, uh, that tend to have that gripe with me at this point. Most everybody is fine with the level of promotion, and, and I've actually had several staff members um, tell me the opposite, where, I, uh, you know, uh, it's a good problem to have where we actually have more than enough people coming to like any preschool program fills up in an instant. So I had our youth department be like, please, please stop promoting our youth programs. Don't, don't do anything for preschool. We're fine in, in preschool. Spend your, spend your time elsewhere. So I've actually had that happen a little more than I've had um, people who are upset that their program isn't promoted as much. Um, 
But, you know, every single program is in our guide that gets mailed to every single resident in our community. Every single program is listed on our website. So everything gets at least two, two listings out there in the world. Um, and, and I will also say that if somebody comes to me with an idea to promote their program outside of our library building, so if they say, hey, I've got this partner, um, they're a really you know, good match for this program and they've offered to help promote it, can I get a flyer to give them? Yes, my answer is yes, absolutely. Please promote our programs outside of our buildings. Um, the things where I kind of pause and really slow down and, and consider more are when they want a poster in our building or a bookmark in our building. It, it, you know, then we're reaching the same people over and over. But anytime people want to promote things outside of our library buildings, I will say yes to that. So um, I do get a couple complaints here and there, but I will say for the most part, people are happy with the level of promotion programs and projects they're receiving. Thank That's you, Hollis. Great. Sorry about that. I had my, yeah. myself on mute. Yeah. Uh, I'm, working oh, okay. on I'm working on creating a whole new marketing request process using an online form. Uh, tips for establishing a process that staff aren't used to? Oh, that's a good one. I guess, at least at my library, I would try to come up with something that's user friendly. So um, whatever form or system it is, if, as long as it's easy to use and to understand, I think you'll be good to go. And then it's, it's all about communicating, like almost to the point where you feel like you're over communicating, like, like, haven't these people heard about this enough already? I feel like I've said it every single day. Nope, say it 10 more times. You haven't said it enough. <laughs> so it, when you're making these big changes, make sure you're communicating about them and really telling people that this is the way we're doing it now. Um, and when people, you know, continue to come to you in person or an email, say, that's great. I'm glad we're starting this conversation. Now can you please go over and submit on, on, our, on our request form? And, you know, I still have that conversation with people years after the fact. You know, the system was in place before I was here. I've been here for a few years. And there are still a few folks who like to come over and chat with me first. And I say, great, I'm glad we had this conversation. Can you please put it in the request form now? Because that's how my team tracks their work and that's how we track our statistics. Um, and that usually works for people. They, everybody understands tracking statistics in a library. So um, that approach usually helps my cause. Excellent. Um, okay, so we, we have so many questions. This is great. <laughs> you all are very interested in this. I'm, I'm really, I'm really pleased. Uh, okay, so uh, Carrie asks, what about, pro uh, about what proportion of your marketing efforts go to programming versus collections versus other services? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so we've definitely tried to balance that out more. Um, I will say we do still spend a, a lot of time promoting our programs. Programming is important and it's a big thing to do. Um, but we've definitely made a concerted effort to focus more on collections and ongoing services. So um, one big effort on my part is I have a content marketing plan where every month I pick a, an ongoing resource or collection or service and we focus on that. So we'll include it in our email newsletter. We'll post about it on social media a couple of times. Um, if I am planning far ahead enough and can get a patron story about using that service and I can get it into the appropriate um, guide that we mail out, we'll do that as well. So we, and we um, do a couple of news stories on the blog on our website as well. So um, that has really helped to bring focus uh, and priority to promoting things other than programs. Because I think the, the challenge is that with programs, there's a deadline, right? Like this program is happening on this day, so we only have X amount of time to promote it. And then it's easier to shove off an ongoing service because it's ongoing. We're always doing that. Oh, we'll come back to it later. So having this content marketing plan, for me at least, has really helped me prioritize promoting things that, that we do all the time but that are just so important and that people use and want to know about and want to use. So. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we might be getting close to 50-50 on programming versus uh, collections and other services for proportion, but I, if I had to guess, we're probably not quite to 50-50 yet. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's maybe a little optimistic in my mind. Okay, great. Uh, so Kristen asks, uh, sorry, Kirsten asks, do you write the content about programming or do the staff who run the programs? That's a little bit of a mix. Um, so in our process for our, our guide and how staff submit programs for that, they do include a description. Um, but my staff does review those descriptions and we have a character count limit for titles. We have a word count limit for descriptions. Um, and we do have sort of a general style as well. And so we do try to go through and edit those 
to make sure they're the appropriate length and then to make sure that they're at least close to our written style. Um, it's such a quick turnaround process on editing the guide. I'm sure you all know about that with your newsletters and brochures. So it's not, it's not perfect. It is far from. Um, but we do try to at least give everything a once over so that it's good grammar and it's you know, close to the style we want. Um, on bigger initiatives, so like right now we have our one book, one community. I, I write pretty much everything associated with that. We want to make sure the message is consistent and clear um, and, and also exciting, right? We really want to get people on board for that so we don't want it to be dry at all. So when there's a bigger thing happening, um, I do tend to scoop that up myself and make sure that um, if I'm not the one writing it that I've really cleaned it up so that it matches our style and that we're communicating everything we need to. Excellent. Uh, okay, so it's uh, it's just after 10:30, and we'll take uh, a couple more questions. And I, but I do want to get to a discussion section of it, um, and we'll probably do that at about 22. Uh, so Sarah asks, uh, what if other department managers aren't on board with the shift in structure and believe their staff should be doing the marketing because? quote, they know their patrons, unquote. Do you think this type of situation might be best alleviated by the type of programming goals, programming, uh, sorry, programming goals, uh, directives pushed by the administration you mentioned? I think uh, that definitely helped me to prioritize which programs to promote more. Um, but I, I think, I think the big part of my message when I made this shift that also stuck with staff is that I tried to explain that this is my job. This is what I was hired to do. I was hired to be the marketing person for this library. I'm never going to come and try to run a story time. I am never going to tell you which items to add to the collection. I don't know about those things. You all went to lots of school to learn how to do all those things and all the other amazing things you do really well. So now let me take marketing off of your plate so you have more time to focus on doing those things and doing a really great job with them and being innovative with them because you don't have to worry about marketing anymore. I'm going to do it. Um, and I think that really helps people kind of put it in perspective. Um, and also kind of reminding like, this isn't, this isn't my first job doing this either. I've done this at other places. Um, you know, I'm, I'm keeping up with marketing trends. I, I'm also here in the library every day. So I can, you know, I can look around and see who our patrons are. I can look at statistics and see who our patrons are. So not, you know, the anecdotal, oh, we know our patrons. Like, okay, you think you do, but look at, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the statistics of who's actually coming to the programs, who's actually checking out these types of items. Um, and sort of having numbers to back up my, my things as well has helped me. So I do think initially in making the change, that was a big talking point for me just to remind people, nope, oh, this, is, this is my job now. You don't have to worry about it because I'm going to worry about it for you. Um, but I will say the programming goals definitely helped me to explain why certain programs were getting more focused than others. So I could kind of, if somebody said, oh, hey, why aren't you, you know, talking more about this program over here? I can say, remember those four goals we have? You're not meeting any of those four goals. It doesn't mean your program isn't good. It doesn't mean your program isn't important. It, you know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do your program, but it just means that as far as marketing is concerned, we might not talk about it quite as much um, because we have these other ones that are meeting these goals, and so we have to talk about those. Uh, great. Um, Rachel has a question that I think you actually were starting to touch on a little bit in that last answer. Uh, her question is, how do you measure the success of your programs? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky, that's a really tricky question. Um, so I, I will say that I'm really, really fortunate that um, even though there are lots of staff members who do programming here, our, our main programs and outreach manager, um, and, and our executive director are very much in the camp of all we should have to do is list a program in our guide and on our website, and that should get you a decent turnout. If just doing that nets zero patrons, then maybe that's not a program we should do, or maybe we need to look about the date or the time that we're offering it. I, I was so excited to be working with these people when I first started here. That's, that's just exactly what you want to hear. It's like it's really hard for me to market a program that no one in our community is interested in. I could shout about it for days and weeks, but if there's just no interest, then there's no interest, right? So it's really great to, to know that success to them is not necessarily the number of people who attend. Um, we could have 
you know, one person come to a book discussion, but that one person walks away really pleased, feeling really great about what they just discussed, feeling really great about the library, and that's success, even if it was only one person, you know, or we could have 50 people show up to a program, but they all leave kind of grumbling, nobody really liked the presenter, it wasn't what we described, and it's like, oh, okay, that program was not great, we need to figure out how to make that better moving forward, even though 50 people came, 40 of them walked away unhappy. So I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, my coworkers here are sort of on the same page that the number of people that attend does not necessarily equal success, um, which makes it, it makes it even harder to measure success. But uh, I think the measures for us um, do tend to be more related to patron feedback and um, the, what we hear from them walking out of a program rather than how many people came or registered. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. And I think for, for everyone out there, uh, success could, could be potentially be different for, for each individual library, depending on your goals and, you know, the way in which you serve your community. So, um, okay. Uh, I see three more that we haven't touched on and we'll try to get to all of them, but, but, but we'll, we'll do it quickly. Uh, Carrie asks for content marketing. Do you come up with the content? Uh, and uh, the examples are blog posts, theme book lists, or highlights, for example, um, or do you get input uh, or submissions from other departments about collections or services they want to promote? Uh, it's a little bit of both. For the most part, I, uh, I come up with most of it. Um, I do solicit our management team to say like, hey, these are topics I'm thinking of. Am I missing anything? Do, do you feel like we talked about one of these too recently? Should I not include it again? So I do um, solicit feedback on the topics. And then once I sort of have my calendar uh, plotted out, then I go to the specific departments for help. So um, if, well, what's one coming up? We're going to talk about e-audiobooks, right? You always have e-audiobooks, so one month we're going to focus on them. So I went to our fiction, movies, and music department and said, hey, do you have any patrons that you know that love audiobooks, specifically e-audiobooks? Can you get me in touch with a patron? I know that might be a challenge, but can you help me? So I try to go back to departments with very specific requests so then uh, it's not like, hey, if a patron happens to like us and has a story, let me know. Like that, that approach hasn't worked. I've, I've tried. Um, it feels a little too nebulous for our staff. But when I can really nail it down for them and say, I'm looking for exactly this, they come back to me with ideas and with help, um, which is fantastic. And then, you know, they're excited to loop in a patron. They feel like they've collaborated. And then I'm excited because I get to talk to a patron about our services, and then um, those patron stories really work well um, and, and really touch other people in our community and get them excited about the things we have happening here. Okay, Julie asks, what do you consider the most effective medium for getting your high priority messages out in the community? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. So I think whenever we do the surveys of how did you hear about this program, the number one thing is still um, our guide that gets mailed out. And I think that's just sort of because people expect it. It comes every other month. It comes to their doorstep. It's, you know, it's easy. And they, they do seem to read it, right? Like we do get a lot of program registration from it. They do, uh, it does help us raise awareness about the, the articles that we put in there about the different things. So that still is important. But I will say with our youth programs and teen programs, the website is very, very quickly gaining um, and actually overtook the guide for some of those demographic groups when we sort of split down, you know, how people were responding to that survey. So the website increasingly is becoming a really great place for us to have information. So um, I, think, I think those two are still our most effective um, in, in at least according to our patrons, <laughs> are the most effective and the places where they are looking to get their library information. You know, that said, we still spend time on social media. We still spend time with email marketing. Um, we, we still make posters and flyers, and um, we have our pop-up library for outreach in the community. So we still do have all these different things and ways where we are communicating with our public. But uh, yeah, our guide and our website are still sort of the, that king and queen that will not be toppled. So we're going to still spend a lot of uh, time and attention on those. Uh, okay, House, this this one um, this this one just came in, but I think it it, it relates a little bit to um, to your last answer. So when you say website, do you mean the event calendar on your website or just the website in general? 
website in general. Um, so the event calendar is, is great, and we make sure that that is accurate and up to date. But uh, we redid our website a few years back, and it is fantastic. I'm, it was a, a team effort, and I'm really proud of how our website looks now. Um, and the, the layout is very simple and very user-friendly, and we only feature a couple main things on our homepage to really help people um, see what our priorities are at the library. And so we can really hit home, you know, one book, one community is a really big deal right now. This spring, it's going to be about our renovation that's happening at our main library. So we can really use the homepage to our advantage for our couple of main marketing messages. And then, of course, we have the event calendar. And honestly, like in our email newsletter, that's the number one click every time. We have a link at the very bottom that says, go to our events calendar to see everything we have. That's, that's people's favorite place to click in our email newsletters. So they do like that online calendar too. That's, that's very cool. That's very interesting. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Um, more questions, but this is great. People, people love this. Uh, and and Alice, thank you for your staying on board here. Uh, I am going to yeah. submit our discussion question for people um, to, to talk about and share their own examples, um, but I am going to try to get to all of the questions that people have answered because you all have been so good and so patient. Um, okay, so where was I? Uh, okay, this is a great one. Miriam asks, how do you make sure marketing efforts are balanced among your branches or at least for staff to feel like it? Yeah, that's a really good question too. So uh, our setup is that we have our one main central library and then we have two branches that we call them our neighborhood branches because they are considerably smaller than our main <laughs> central library. If you've ever been to the, the main library here at Schomburg, our branches are nothing like our main library. And so it, I feel really bad saying this, but they often get forgotten. People like don't realize we have these other two locations. Um, and so we, you know, we send them posters, we send them flyers, we make sure um, they have the materials that we need. But uh, just, just recently, actually within the last few months, um, some of the roles and responsibilities within my department have shifted. And so I was able to designate one of my team members as our branch liaison. And so part of her role is now to go to the branches at least once a month, hopefully more like twice a month, and just check in with them. and, and Number one, make sure they aren't going rogue because that happens at our branches a lot where we have these brand standards. We have a whole marketing team dedicated to making your marketing materials for you. And for whatever reason, they feel like they can't ask or they're a bother until so, like they make their own signs. And we're like, no, please, please just ask us to do it for you. We want to do it so that it all looks consistent. So she's going to make sure that, that they have everything they need from us, that they don't feel like they have to be making their own signs and things. Um, but then also talking to them about what's effective, right? Like, so we send them flyers for, hey, here's all the branch youth programs coming up. Do people take those? Do they want something different? We make this really great calendar for um, youth in general that has all of the locations, but maybe we should make youth branch calendars. I don't know. So that's really new for us, but I'm really excited about it to make our branches feel more integrated in our marketing efforts. Um, so I, I think that's going to be, at least for now, that's our goal is to have her visiting with staff there, giving the marketing team a presence there to make sure they do feel included. Um, and hopefully the marketing efforts become more balanced because they feel included and because we're reaching out more. So uh, in the meantime, uh, I've posted the first discussion question. Uh, this is for you all to answer. Who manages the marketing process in your library and what does it look like? Um, so when you're answering, just remember to use A1 with your answer so that we can sort of keep the questions and answers together. Um, but we want to hear from you, and this is your chance to have your, um, to, to discuss the way that you do marketing in your library, because everybody, again, is different. Um, okay, Hollis, um, this actually relates to the previous question a little bit, and I think this is a good one. Uh, where and how often do you distribute pr print marketing materials? And the examples are area schools, town hall, uh, et cetera. And then uh, kind of a separate question, but a corollary, corollary is, do you post any online event calendars? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take the second part first. We do post to online event calendars. Not very many. It's like Daily Herald and Trib Local. I don't think, I don't think Schomburg has a patch anymore. So there's only, there's only a few, but we do post to those. Um, and that tends to be either for our really big, like priority events. Again, I keep telling you guys one book, one community, but that's like 
that's our big thing right now. So, you know, those programs are going on online event calendars. Um, but then also uh, mission specific things. So um, book discussions for all ages are really important that go there. Uh, literacy related programs go on those. So things that are sort of like mission critical to a library, those are what we post on online event calendars. By no means do we post every single event. Um, typically in a two month period, we have um, like 250 events. So we don't post all of those on online calendars. And then distributing print materials, um, uh, is sort of a, on, on an as-needed basis based on partnerships and other opportunities. So, um, for example, we have sensory programs for kids, like a sensory story time um, for kids who have different sensory needs or who might be on the autism spectrum. And so our school district has, um, oh gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch the name of it, but it's sort of like an early intervention um, program, preschool program, and so we always give them specific flyers for our sensory programs. So when there's a very specific um, correlation like that, we make sure to reach out and say, hey, can you distribute this to all these kids in this program? And then our school district is fabulous, so they're great about helping us with that. But otherwise, we don't have like specific stops of like, okay, we drop the guide off at town hall and this place and that place. We don't do that, um, and it, it hasn't really uh, been a detriment to us at all, so we haven't added it just because it would be an, an added print cost for us and then also sort of a time, a time cost for staff to be running around and, and making those drop-offs. Uh, okay, great. We're, we're seeing some uh, answers come into that first discussion question. Um, uh, the, again, the question, who manages the library marketing process in your library? What does it look like? Katie says, my library has a marketing team of one. She says, me. <laughs> uh, I ask the programmers to submit event information via a Google Doc, and I use that information to post to social media, our website, and our newsletter. Great. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Kathy says, uh, same thing, me, the marketing specialist, Department of One, uh, plus a freelance designer, uh, set, process, and calendar. Oh, thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, Sarah says, for the past year, I've been trying to shift our marketing from staff to a marketing department. Uh, before, we had a public information graphics department that more or less just produced print and graphic items for staff who submitted paper request forms. In the past year, we've shifted to digital request form and also implemented a strategic plan that communicates how marketing functions in our library and uh, is the primary agent in marketing our programs and services. This did not go over well with staff initially mm -hmm. and is a process for perfecting. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, you're very brave and, uh, and good luck to you <laughs> in that in yeah. that process change um, isn't easy right i mean it's it's always a challenge so kudos to you to sticking with it and for, <laughs> for yeah. keeping, keeping in the game it's tough it is it sometimes it's easier when you're the new person and you can and you just have the you have the agency to do that kind of thing uh you don't come in with um you know any sort of um uh you know you have you don't have history with your organization i'll say uh, Julie says each department does their own posters. They also submit their events to a central staff person for calendar, website, and social media inclusion. For press release, they submit it to the programming person for distribution. The problem is they all think they do what they do is the most important thing going on in the library. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. Julie, thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, Noreen says library director with staff letting me know what they want out there. Uh, great. Uh, Kirsten says, I do. It's always a scramble. We do an eight-page print newsletter every other month, a monthly e-newsletter, both in English and in Spanish. Wow. Everyone is pro everyone in programming makes their own flyers and adds the event to our online calendar. I maintain the website that will hopefully be getting updated soon. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, Ashley says, I currently manage it, tech, uh, parentheses, technical services, but it has sort of been passed around staff. I take care of the newsletter, some of the flyers, not all. Uh, E-newsletter, social media requests are kind of a hodgepodge as it's not my main duty. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, Sheila says, marketing associate, which is me. As of now, it's a part-time position, which does give it some pushback. Uh, been here nine for nine months. I'm responsible for newsletter, e-news, all social media. Staff has been okay with it, except for the social media part, especially Facebook. They can't let, have, <laughs> they can't let go of having access to Facebook. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, wow. Okay. A lot of different answers. It, it's, this is really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying seeing all the different responses. 
Um, okay, so I want to get back to a question, Hollis, if you don't mind. We have about 10 yeah. minutes left here. Uh, okay, so Beth asked the question, was the marketing department involved in creating the new website? Yes, yes, we were. Um, so quick, quick backstory, uh, in every other job that I've had, managing the website has been part of my job as the marketing director. And so to come to a library and not have the website was really weird for me. <laughs> but our digital service team here is fantastic. And now I uh, am very glad that they're here and that they manage it because there are so many different things um, with the digital resources that I wouldn't know where to begin. So I'm very grateful to have them and um, very thankful that I was involved in the process of, of redesigning our website. So they brought me in right away. Um, not only for, um, you know, making sure that the website uh, was um, in alignment with our new, our new branding since we had just done a brand refresh. So, you know, colors and fonts and all that, I was in there for that to make sure we aligned with that, but then also for user experience. Um, I think our website before was kind of a hodgepodge of everything that, again, lots of people had access to make changes and do all these things. Um, and so they were looking to zip it up and say, nope, there's only a couple people now that are going to have access to make these changes. Um, and so we, we still we collaborate really well together and, and work together to make sure the, the content featured on the home page is what we want it to be, that they have the assets from me that they need to do that. Um, and then also, you know, managing um, Communico, which is our event service and having the online calendar up to date. So I was very involved in, in the launch of the new website and then we continue to collaborate daily just to make sure everything is there that we want to be there and that we have everything we need. Great. And one more, I'm sorry, Kirsten, I missed this from before. Um, I, actually, you know what, I just, I also want to mention that um, I put in a second discussion question for you all. Um, again, we want to hear from you. Uh, question two is, how do you make decisions on what gets promoted? What are your main criteria for deciding the time and resources that go into promoting an event, service, or program? And you can answer in the chat box using A2. Uh, so going back to a question that I'm sorry I missed, Kirsten, uh, this, uh, this is uh, for you, Hollis. Uh, what, mm -hmm. or sorry, how far in advance of a program do you need in order to promote it properly? Oh, okay. So on February 1st, we are going to start working on our April, May, is that right? Our April, May guide? Yeah. <laughs> so, so February 1st is uh, we pull a report out of Communico with all of the programs that have been entered for April and May, and then we start to whip it into shape and turn it into our guide. So um, pretty quickly after February 1 is when I will create that giant matrix to um, to show every single program and all the different ways we're going to promote it. So um, it's about two months before that I start making my promotional plans for it because then that allows time for me to share that matrix with department heads and they can give feedback and then I can uh, have my team get it entered in our system and then they can get to work on it. So then those programs coming up in early April that those get the attention that they need. Um, so I, yeah, I would say it's about a two month lead time for you know, just general programs. For our bigger initiatives, I mean, we're already working on our summer challenge now. Um, so you know, I'm not, I'm not specifically promoting it right now, but I'm uh, part of part of that team that's figuring everything out. So then I'm, I'm very integrated and I know all the details. And so it's not like a last minute scramble of ah, we need to promote this. It's like nope, Hollis has been looped in. She knows what we're doing. She knows what's going on. She knows how to make this happen for us. So on the, on the big stuff, I'm looped in pretty much as early as, as they start planning. Um, and then on the, I'll call them the day-to-day -day programs, those are about two months in advance where we start, uh, start figuring it all out for our guide and then for other promotions. Uh, we've we've got one um, response. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. We just we just got another. We've got two responses to the discussion question. Sarah says, I, "Just a reminder: the question was, how do you make decisions on what gets promoted? What are your main criteria for deciding the time and resources that go into promoting an event, service, or program?" Katie says, "I sat down with programmers to come up with a program standard for each department. Those standards are in line with our mi library's mission and our strategic plan, goals, and objectives." Awesome. Uh, Sarah, we have. Sarah says, "We have." program priority levels. Yes, great. I look at attendance numbers to determine which programs need a parking push. If they're brand new, they automatically get all the bells and whistles. Staff let me know which programs are still building an audience and could benefit from a push. 
Uh, Cindy says, when someone has to register for it, we promote it. If it costs money, uh, library or patron, we promote it. Those things take priority and then the rest is promoted as needed. Uh, Rhonda says, we promote every program. It's the expectation. Everything is on our website. Everything is in our programming guide, program guide. Everything gets listed and boosted as a Facebook event. Every program gets its own flyer and takeaway handout. We send a monthly e-blast about our online resources. With 600 annual programs and a two-person marketing department, it's too much. Yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then she also makes a comment, Hollis has the wheels turning. So good. that's, that's, that's a good, good. Yep. Uh, Julie says, I make the decision based on a matrix inside my head. Not very democratic, but we are in a very big library. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I want to go back to, that's all we have for responses. And I want to go back to a question that uh, Rachel asked. Uh, Rachel asked, what, quite, what channels do you use to reach community partners like teachers and schools? Yeah, so we have really great relationships with both our elementary and high school districts. Um, we have designated librarians that are community outreach librarians, both for elementary and for teens. So uh, they make regular visits to the schools. So we have a pretty continuous presence in our area schools and in our um, high schools. Our high schools, even more so, actually, like I think we're going to we have three high schools in our district, um, and I think two of them we're at like twice a month, and the other one we're there once a month. So we're at the high schools all the time. Um, and for our high schools, we also have student advisory trustees on our board, and so they do a lot of work to help promote the library services to other students and to teachers, honestly, and, and school staff. Um, the elementary school district. Uh, again, we have our community outreach librarian, and so she's in there, you know, making sure the kids and the, and the teachers know what's happening um, at the libraries. But then I'll also say we in our community have, uh, we, we don't have a name for this group. We call it the communicators group, which is just ridiculous. But it's, so it's like, it's my counterpart at all the other local agencies. So like the villages we serve, the park districts in our, in our area, the school districts in our area. So it's probably like quarterly we all get together for a meeting and we have, we do like a little professional development, like somebody will kind of teach a little topic and we'll learn, but then we also have time to share and say like, this is priority for us going on. This is priority for us. And then it's time for people to like raise their hand and be like, oh yeah, I'll help you with that. Send me your flyer. Oh yeah, I can do that for you. If, you know, is it on Facebook? I'll just share it on Facebook. Great. Um, so that's really great to have that ongoing and open dialogue with those people because I know what their priorities are, they know what ours are, and then we can kind of keep an eye out for those things and help promote them because it's, you know, we're all serving the same people in the same community, even though it might feel like we're competing sometimes, we're really working together. I mean, we're all government agencies, we're all really trying to, to make a better community for everybody, so it's really helpful for us to have that open dialogue. Um, and then I don't feel bad when I send an email to one of them and say, oh, hey, can I, can I send you this poster? Will you put it up? Like, they almost always say yes, because we know each other, we, we get together, we help each other. So I think um, those personal connections are actually really important to us for our local partners, um, especially those, those big ones, the schools and the villages and things. Okay, thanks, Alice. Uh, we, just some more answers that came in. Uh, Ashley says, uh, this is the question again, um, how do you decide what gets promoted? As she says, everything that we have planned at the time gets in the newsletter eventually, uh, makes makes its way to Facebook events and listed in our weekly library happenings e-newsletter, monthly program posters for youth and teen, print flyers as needed for regular events, big events usually get a poster for display and quarter sheets for pass out a checkout. We also tend to do print more for youth events since we do outreach to the schools about twice a year. Uh, Sheila says, I promote any and all programs that do not have a program attendance limit on it. Carrie says, we have a monthly marketing meeting between our uh, program, oh, sorry, our assistant director, myself, marketing associate, outreach coordinator, and heads of both youth and adult to discuss what's coming up and what we want to promote in the coming months. When uh, our, all of our programs go in our quarter, quarterly newsletter and family drop-in programs get flyers and posters, we promote three of our biggest, most pricey adult programs each month, and, month, and one a youth and adult program uh, get Facebook events each month. The Marketing Associate and I also collaborate with our digital services librarian to promote two digital services per month. And then Kathy says, we are a small library. I meet with the library director and head librarian quarterly to review what's happening several months out. 
all events get in our newsletter and our calendar. Beyond that, I'm open to what staff wants to promote as long as it meets our strategic goals, uh, flyers, screens, Facebook events, other, but do have a cap of how many of each. Librarian staff need to, uh, need to ask head librarian who makes requests to me as part of our newsletter calendar process. Okay, uh, we are actually just a little bit beyond 11, so I'm going to pull this to a close. Uh, but before I do, I really want to thank Hollis. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you everyone for the great questions uh, and answers that you provided. Uh, this was a lot of fun here today. As a reminder, this is going to be, uh, this is was recorded and will be available from the Rails uh, YouTube page um, tomorrow. You should be getting an email with a link to that so you can check it out. Um, we really appreciate you participating again in these online uh, roundtables. Uh, we have a couple more coming up. Check them out. Make sure that you're accessing Rails uh, webinars on the My Library is topic. And uh, everyone, have a great Tuesday. Thanks so much for coming.